Look, it's almost Valentine's Day and I think some of you might need a refresher on the difference between a romantic gesture and stalker behavior. Because apparently, some people really don't know the difference. For example, many years ago I was dating this guy. He was a real loser, but I dated him for two years. And for two years, he treated me like trash. He wasn't abusive or anything, not physically anyway, but he just constantly disregarded my feelings and made me feel small and worthless, flirted with other girls, you know, whatever. Anyway, I eventually managed to grow a backbone and I broke up with him. And you'd think, after devaluing me for two years, he'd have no problem letting me go. But oh no, my friend, because once I broke up with him, this guy who never did anything nice for me while we were together, suddenly he's just teeming with romantic notions. And they all came squirming out of him like maggots at a roadkill, baby. So one day, a couple weeks after I broke up with him, I was leaving work. And at the time, I was working as a receptionist at a salon. So after the salon closed, me and another girl, we'd like clean up and lock up the salon together and head out. So we just finished closing and we step out into the dark parking lot. And across the parking lot, I see that there's something on my car. So I look at my coworker and I'm like, what the fuck is that? And we go a little closer and I see that there's roses and a teddy bear on my car. And I'm like, what the fuck? Because I have no idea who left these. And I know you're thinking, duh, bitch. It's your garbage ex who refuses to let you go. But I actually didn't think it was him because when we were together, he refused to ever spend any money on me because all of his wages had to go to parts for his Mustang and go to Buffalo Wild Wings with his friends. So my coworker and I, we inspect all these items and there's no note or anything, no way to figure out who they're from. So I'm like, okay. I'm gonna go home and sit in the corner with a knife for the rest of the night, I guess. So my coworker turns around and starts heading to her car. And as I go to get in my car, a fucking hand reaches out from under my car and grabs me by the ankle. Yes, babe. My ex-boyfriend was hiding underneath my car in the parking lot outside of my job. And you may be surprised to learn that this gesture did not melt my stone cold bitch heart and convince me to take him back. Because the thing about this gesture was, it wasn't actually about me at all. It was all about him. If he thought about me at any point while planning this romantic gesture, he might have remembered all of the times that I ranted about how I think the custom of giving women teddy bears is gross and infantilizing. Or how disconcerting it would be for me to step out into a dark parking lot and see an unknown object on the hood of my car. Or how a man crawling out from under my car is literally nightmare fuel. Or just, you know, the fact that I'd broken up with him and told him to leave me alone. But he didn't. He didn't think about any of that. So, now that we've broken down all the ways in which this particular romantic gesture was actually stalker behavior, let's see if you can count the red flags in today's story. In fact, let's make it a drinking game. Pour yourself a nice glass of something and let's take a sip every time something creepy happens. Because by the end of this story, you're gonna want to be drunk. Because today, I'm gonna tell you about a man so bad at romance that the object of his affections didn't even need to be alive. Maria Elena Milagro de Hoyos was born in 1909. Though not much is known about her life, we do know that she was the daughter of a Cuban-American cigar maker, that she had two sisters, and that she typically went by Elena. Elena grew up in Key West, Florida, and by her early teens, she was something of a local legend. Renowned for her beauty, Elena drew the attention of several suitors, but at 17 she married a boy her age named Louis Mesa. But the couple didn't stay together for long. After Elena suffered a miscarriage, Louis abandoned his young bride and moved to Miami, though the two never legally divorced. Maybe they would have eventually, but for Elena, time was short. In April of 1930, at only 21 years old, Elena was admitted to the Marine Hospital in Key West, where she was found to be in the final fatal stages of a tuberculosis infection. And as if that wasn't bad enough, enter Carl Tanzler. What's there to say about Carl? 
He was born in Germany in 1877. He grew up in Imperial Germany and apparently as a child. Karl claimed that he was visited in a dream by his ancestor, Countess Anna Constantia von Kossel. Check this out! Bitch in a ham shell! What? Countess von Kossel apparently popped into Karl's dream to show him the face of his true love, who he described as an exotic, dark-haired woman. Carl apparently never forgot this dream and he was forever searching for the true love that his ancestor had showed to him. So Carl wound up in Australia during the First World War and allegedly escaped an internment camp by way of sailboat while under the assumed identity of Count von Kossel. Eventually he returned to Germany, married a woman named Doris, had two kids, and then promptly fucked off to Havana, Cuba. From Cuba, he settled in Florida, where he was eventually joined by his wife and two children. In Florida, Carl got a job as a radiologist in the Marine Hospital under the identity of Carl von Kossel. What were his credentials, you ask? None. But when Elena came to the hospital dying of consumption, Dr. Carl was in the house. And would you believe it? As soon as he saw her, Carl knew this was her. The exotic, dark-haired woman from his vision. His true love. But obviously there was kind of a huge problem because Elena was dying. But no worries. Carl told Elena and her mother that he would save her life because they were destined to be together. So after the hospital released Elena, Carl began treating her at her parents' home. He stole medicines and supplies from the hospital and dosed Elena with all kinds of experimental cocktails. Which unsurprisingly, considering Carl's total lack of actual medical knowledge, did nothing to help Elena. So Carl loved his game. He brought x-rays and electrical equipment to Elena's parents' house. And he attempted to treat her with radiation and electroshock therapy, which as you can imagine imagine just left her more in pain as the deadly infection continued to progress. But it didn't matter because Carl was in love and he didn't try to hide it either. He showered Elena with gifts of jewelry and clothing, professing his love for her while continuing to make grandiose promises that he would heal her so that they could be together. And while we have no account that tells us how Elena felt about Carl's obsessive interest in her, what we do know is that Carl was significantly older, married, and exploiting a power imbalance by continuing to use Elena and her family's desire for a cure to continue to have contact with Elena. Like, of course they didn't tell him to fuck off. He made them think that he was some kind of medical savant with a secret cure to tuberculosis. And wouldn't you know it, he wasn't. Turns out, electrocuting someone doesn't cure an infectious disease. And after over a year of botched treatments from Dr. Carl, Elena died at her parents' home on October 25th, 1931. But baby, you know the story doesn't end there. Because Elena was Carl's true love. The bitch on the half shell said so. So Carl paid for a lavish funeral for Elena and commissioned the construction of a very special above ground mausoleum, one he could visit every night. And that's just what he did. Carl went to Elena's mausoleum in Key West Cemetery every night to spend time with his true love. What would he do there, you ask? Well, he says that he would sing Elena her favorite Spanish song. Can you imagine? You think you finally shook off this mortal coil and this dweeb-ass weirdo along with it, and you just settle into your final resting place to snooze in silence for all eternity. And this motherfucker shows up to serenade you in broken Spanish with a German accent? Oh boy. And you'd think the smell of his true love rotting away in her casket would convince Carl finally that it was over. But no, Carl was still certain that he and Elena would be together. Only now, 
he'd just have to bring her back from the dead. And according to Carl, Elena was into it. Because it turns out, it's not just bitches in a half shell that like to visit Carl. See, Elena's ghost started showing up to these midnight rendezvous, and Carl said that Elena's ghost told him to take her body with him. Uh-huh. But Carl didn't need Elena to stay fresh, I guess, because he waited until 1933, two years after Elena had been interred. Then, one night, he entered the cemetery with a toy wagon, removed Elena's moldering corpse from her casket, and wheeled her on home. Oh, baby, you know what's coming next. Of course, Elena was in an advanced state of decomposition, so Carl began by attaching her bones with piano wire. He gave her glass eyes and patched her decomposing skin with silk cloth soaked in wax and plaster of Paris. He collected the hair that fell from her rotting scalp and fashioned a wig for her. And he filled her collapsing abdominal cavity with rags to keep her form. had clothes for Elena and he liked to doll her up with nice dresses and jewelry. He used heavy perfume and disinfectants to mask the smell of decomposition and he kept the corpse in his bed and slept next to it every night. Carl was even seen dancing with Elena's corpse through an open window. That must have been a sight. Let me tell you, if I saw that shit, I'd be needing a pair of glass eyes too, because I'd be clawing my peepers straight out of my skull. And I bet you're wondering, was he, you know, consummating his love? And most disturbingly, I do have to report that a paper tube was installed for less messy penetration. <laughs> Now, Carl lived in creepy bliss with his corpse bride for many years, continuing to patch her up with wax-soaked silk and plaster as she decayed, and presumably, hopefully, replacing the paper tube every so often. <laughs> and I don't know how the rumors began, but eventually word got out that Carl had Elena's corpse in his bed. I really wish we had more details on this. Was it because of him dancing with her in front of the window? Because like I can't help imagining him like having people over and introducing them to this putrefying plaster sex doll corpse and being like, my wife. Whatever the case, Elena's sister eventually heard the rumors. And in October of 1940, she went to Carl's house to confront him. There, she witnessed the horrifying reconstruction of her sister herself, and she immediately informed authorities that Carl had corpse-snapped Elena. Look, I don't typically support snitches, but in this case, let's lock this fucker away and burn his neckbeard nest to the ground, you feel me? Anyway, the police raided Carl's home where they found Elena and arrested Carl. He was examined and found competent to stand trial, and he was charged with wantonly and maliciously destroying a grave and removing a body without authorization. Which I guess is the legal term for being a nice guy necrophile. But here's the thing. Once Carl was detained, Elena's body was still not allowed to rest. Her garishly painted corpse was put on display at a local funeral home where it was viewed by over 7,000 people. The story spread rapidly not just by word of mouth, but through the media, in Key West and nationwide. Now, you've been following along here, right? We both agree that Carl is a creep. We've been drinking to it the whole time. So surely, we're not in the minority here, right? No, bitch. Of course, this absolute horror show was completely misconstrued by the media and society at large. We live in a patriarchy, babe. It was never considered how 
Elena felt about Carl before her death, or whether she'd approve of Carl fishing her out of her casket to piano wire her bones together and shove a paper fuck tube up her cooch. No. Carl was a romantic, so devoted to his lost love that even the grave couldn't keep them apart. And because of the public support for Carl, the court dismissed the case, citing the statute of limitations on the crime. Because Carl had lived so long with Elena's corpse that he was beyond being charged for it. And I guess they could have charged him for everything else he'd done to it, but why would they? Who could charge a man for simply loving too much? <laughs> protect Elena's corpse, she was reburied in an unmarked grave in Key West Cemetery, though rumors persisted that Carl returned there at night to search for her grave. Eventually, Carl moved closer to his wife because, yeah, he was still married. Just like during all the Elena stuff, he was living uh, in Key West closer to the hospital while his wife and children were living in Zephyr Hills. But his wife stuck with him and Carl relocated to a home in Pasco County, closer to his actual spouse. But the thing is, she wasn't his true love. So even though Carl's wife was forced to support him monetarily in his later years, Carl continued to long for Elena. He wrote an autobiography detailing his romance, which was published by Fantastic Adventures magazine in 1947. And using a death mask that he apparently obtained of Elena, he went about recreating the effigy of his dead love. Now, there are rumors that Carl was given or found Elena's remains, and that the wax effigy that he kept in his home wasn't a replica, but Elena's actual corpse. But no one knows for sure. Carl lived out his final years with his wax bride, and when he died in 1952 at age 75, his body wasn't discovered for three weeks because apparently, no one liked visiting Carl that much. So what have we learned here today? What can Carl's love for Elena teach us about romance? Well, if your idea of a romantic gesture is so selfish that your would-be paramour doesn't even need to be alive to receive it, maybe it's not that romantic. So enjoy this season of romance. And if you don't have a date, baby, be your own valentine. Treat yourself. Buy yourself some nice chocolate and get yourself your favorite takeout. Watch Crimson Peak and Bram Stoker's Dracula. Don't let the capitalist machine tell you that Valentine's Day should make you feel lonely. You are your own best company. Love yourself. And remember, better to be single then pursued by a dude who thinks a bare-titted countess came to him in a dream and told him you're his true love. At least this way, you won't end up with your bones held together by piano wire. <laughs> I just poured wine down my face. <laughs> I'm real drunk. I need anything today. I still have a fucking cold. By the way, I'm not still sick. I'm sick again. I got sick again. Anyway, I love you. Thank you for being here, love yourself, and happy Valentine's Day.